wanted with franchise to achieve two things. One, engage in a more nuanced conversation than the ones that I was currently hearing in the food justice movement about race, health disparities, and food access. Something that was moving away from the discourse that Black people were either ignorant or irresponsible in the way they fed themselves and their children, and they manifested that by consuming fast food. I wanted to interrupt that discourse. But the other thing that I wanted to really think about is the ways that in McDonald's entering Black communities immediately after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, the ways that McDonald's in some parts of Black America had replaced the state, or I should say from my perspective, what the state should be doing in providing um, you know, this idea that a McDonald's could provide the economic stability, could provide the first jobs, could double as the senior center, could be the place where kids play after school. What did it mean for a fast food, fast food restaurant to have so much um, outsized impact in black communities? And how did we get there? And as the book unfolds and the book is, you know, um, talking about the 1960s, but I think in many ways is so relevant today when we think about the responses to racial injustice from the corporate sector. And we should say, I mean, that um, when we talk, well, we, we will get there in, in a moment, but the the response of having businesses do what is desperately needed or at least uh, attempt to do what is desperately needed in many of these communities is sort of like the... Um, perfect encapsulation of, of a neoliberal project here where uh, the market is going to take care of these things. Um, but let me let, I just want to start on that first part about, you know, interrupting the and uh, the that 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 question of uh, of of nutrition and of uh, McDonald's in these uh, in, in black communities and that concept of like food deserts in some mm -hmm. respect. Um, uh, it, like what what was it about that conversation that you felt like needed interrupting that it was too limited and, and not or or it was like super judgy kind of racist it was this idea that very well-intentioned and well-meaning people would say things like you know if only people knew about growing and making kale then we could actually you know disrupt rates of hypertension and diabetes and i think the two things about fast food that are often not acknowledged in these conversations, whether they come from the public health sector or the social justice sector, is that one, fast food is a practical choice for many Americans because it is cheap, because it is a lot of fuel very fast, because it's perfect if you're working two or three jobs. Um, but more than anything else, that every relationship we have to food has to be nurtured. There has to be an introduction of the food. There's nothing kind of natural about this type of affinity that we we often place between uh, poor people, particularly poor people of color and fast food, that this is relationship that has to be structured. And I think that a lot of conversations around food justice and access, they'll say, well, there's no grocery stores. Okay, this is great. But once people have all this fresh food, can they pay their utility? utility bills? Do they have time to prepare food? Where are their kids? Are they worried about them? You know, where are the elderly in this community? And so I, I just wanted us to take a step back um, away from the suggestion that if everyone had access to what we call good or quality or healthy food, then we would eradicate these problems that are based on diet instead of looking at the larger structures like capitalism that will ultimately undermine our best efforts unless we start to think about where structures appear. And 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 I think um, well, I think there's also a specific role that at the very least there was an attempt for this institution, I guess, of fast food to play in a lot of these communities. Um, I mean, that was sort of, I guess, the, theoretically the idea on some level. And, and, and maybe we'll get to, you know, to what extent they're playing that role. But let's go back to um, the you know where we were well, let's, let's do a you, you give a, a, a sort of a a, a, a history a slight history of the development of fast food mm -hmm. um tell us that so that we have the context in which um you know what a shift it was in the wake of the assassination of uh dr martin luther king in 1968 uh, that era to to move fast food into black communities. 
So in the early 1960s, you know, fast food, particularly fast food franchising, had such a like frenzy in the United States. Everyone wanted to replicate the success of McDonald's, which was the first publicly traded fast food company. McDonald's grows from Southern California and expands in highways and bedroom communities and suburbs. And Ray Kroc, who would create the franchise system that we have today, he says that McDonald's grows up in the suburbs. And suburbs means something in the early 1960s. Um, but by 1968, two things are happening in the fact. Right. I mean, let's white. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the kind of audience that gets what I mean. But I'm going to say it means white people. It means um, white people who have disposable income. And white who people fled the cities. Uh, and who have fled the cities because of um, what they perceive as urban decline. But it's about creating distance from uh, particularly black people, but also moving capital out of the cities. And so by the late 1960s, two things are happening. One, in some parts of the city where there is McDonald's, there is a big demographic shift from white to black. And some white franchisees of McDonald's don't want to do business in those communities anymore, especially after you know many summers of racial unrest. The second thing that's happening is that after King's assassination, there are some real questions among the civil rights establishment as to what's our next move? Where's the pivot? We have seen great disappointment from the legislative and court victories since the 1950s. Schools are not integrated equally. We don't have equal access to public accommodations. And none of these things matter because there's such a wealth gap between Black and white in America that people who had been very much dedicated to the nonviolent struggle were saying, you know, maybe we need to start thinking about economics in a different way, not just the boycott, but getting a piece of the action. And so it's this like perfect storm after King's assassination, because the corporate sector is seeing that they need to be responsive to the fact that they've excluded so many people. And then the civil rights movement establishment is actually moving away from King's vision of thoughtful analysis of poverty and capitalism and saying, if we're not going to get our fair share, maybe we start opening businesses. And at the same time, the franchise model is being endorsed by, you know, everyone as this kind of get rich quick scheme. So it's this like perfect moment. I mean, it's so much like today in so many ways where we have this kind of speculative economy. We also have this incredibly like, you know, this second Gilded Age. And then we have these corporations and other institutions that are trying to respond to racial unrest. And it comes in the form of, we know the answer, McDonald's and black communities. So, all right, wait. So I want to take those two uh, like ends of the uh, mm -hmm. equation, I guess, which would be, you know, the sort of corporate America's um, um, response to, we have multiple major urban centers, um, you know, going through uprisings and mm -hmm. destruction of property. And uh, and then the, the, the in, in the wake of, of the death of Martin Luther King, a shift within at least some elements of the civil rights mm -hmm. movement to less of a critique of capital and more of a sense of like, well, maybe we need to get power within the context of the system rather than talk about uh, changing it. So from the corporate side, um, I think you raised the the issue of, of disaster capitalism. Like there is, this is one hundred percent. This is the the intention is less about what can we do for racial relations in this country, and more about how can we exploit an opportunity that exists, and also perhaps, I mean, I uh, the the instance of. Um, of uh jones i believe his name was the ronald jones like mm -hmm. that, like how much so tell the story of ronald jones yep. and then also the uh, so there's like the, these two elements i think that that you talk about is the disaster capitalism uh, situation where it's like we we can move in here and mm -hmm. uh, get some you know market share market share and and then the other part is maybe this is also like we can get some protection on one flank or another so right so one so after king's assassinated um roland jones is a manager at a mcdonald's in washington dc and he is seeing um dc particularly the u street corridor you know going up in flames 
And he is asked by McDonald's to kind of go to Chicago to recruit the first black franchise owner. And it's this kind of this perfect convergence of how disaster capitalism works, right? You have the initial shock event of King's assassination, um, one of, you know, a number of political assassinations that happens in the 60s. You have the deep confrontations between everyday people and the police, right? The, the kind of law and order stuff that is going to unfold. And then you have this corporation that is trying to protect its restaurants, not just because it's their restaurants, but they own the property in which those restaurants are built. McDonald's is one of the largest landowners in the United States because they they own their real estate. And so you also have um, these white franchise owners who are doing business that is either in black communities or too close. And they're saying, we don't want this. And so this is a process that is like mirrors so much of the horrors of the, the real estate sector, where there's like white flight, the movement of capital and the movement of tax dollars. But McDonald's is not just saying we want to, you know, we want to respond to the needs of the black community. They are also going to be supported by a Nixon administration that is giving federal funds for minority owned businesses. And at this time, franchises are considered small businesses. And they also will have the endorsement of major civil rights organizations that I think are exhausted and irritated by the failures that they saw throughout the 60s, whether it was on racial integration or the war on poverty. And they're going to start talking about business ownership. And this is the place in which um, Black self-determination will be um, will be realized. And so you have these kind of two impulses. And the thing about business as a strategy for either racial inclusion or to suppress racial unrest, it captivates people on the left and the right. Um, because people on the left will say, well, I guess black self-determination and black power is important. So owning your business is good. And then people on the right love this because if you build black communities, no one will say, wait a second, but there's a white community here that's getting more tax dollars, more infrastructure, better quality housing and better schools. It's this desire to build within hyper segregated environments and keep everyone quiet. 